Good morning, good afternoon, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alec and I'm going to be here today to help answer any of your general or technical questions here in the background. But before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of things you need to know about the session today. There's no dial-in number for attendees. All audio will be streamed through your computer speakers or headphones, so please adjust your volume there accordingly. You can submit questions for today's speaker or any technical issues you may run into by clicking on the Q&A icon located on the right-hand side of your screen. Click on that icon there labeled here with this top arrow, type in your question and click submit. You can download a PDF of the slides today by clicking on the handouts icon also located on the right hand side of your screen labeled here with this bottom arrow. Just click there and you should be able to pull down a PDF. If you submit a technical question, I'll have an answer for you that will appear on your screen shortly after you submit. And if it's content related, we may pull it during the Q&A session if time allows today. Today's webinar is being recorded. You're gonna receive a link to that recording in a follow-up email. So please allow at least a couple business days before that information is sent. In that same follow-up, you're gonna have a link to download a PDF of the slides, as well as your HRCI and SHRM certification information for today. All right, so our speaker today is Andy Vitale, the Director of User Experience at Polaris Industries, a global power sports leader and he is responsible for leading user experience design across Polaris's innovative product lines. So with that being said, we're gonna jump right into things. So I'm gonna to toss things over to Andy now. Andy? Hey everyone, I'm going to take a second just to uh, get my screen set up for everybody. Um, we're gonna jump right in. So I am clicking, but nothing's happening. Let me try a different window. Sorry about that. So I'm not able to connect, right? I hope this might. All right, let me try something else. Okay, got it. I should be. Rocking and rolling, sorry about that. Um, boom. All right, sorry about those technical difficulties. Uh, we've got it straightened out. So hello everyone, thank you for uh, this session. My name is Andy Vitale and I am the Director of User Experience at Polaris Industries. If you're not familiar with Polaris, uh, think about companies like Indian Motorcycle, Snowmobiles, off-road vehicles like the Ranger, the Razor. We make um, government vehicles and electric vehicles. I'm currently based in Minnesota uh, and it is 86 degrees today. If you were wondering, it's not snowing. So a little bit more about my past before Polaris. I worked for 3M leading a team in their healthcare business group that worked on physical and digital products for patients, payers, and providers uh, across six different divisions. And then focusing on enterprise software, we also designed a, a learning platform for healthcare called Healthcare Academy. Some of you may be familiar with uh, my ties to education go back further than that. I'm on the advisory board for University of Wisconsin Stout. I often lecture at the University of Minnesota. I teach online for Kent State University's user experience master's program. I just came back from New York working with Urban Arts Partnership which um, basically are high school students that are getting after school education in, in digital software. I'm also the former department chair for a graphic design program at Kaiser University in Florida, where I help them transition from a career college to a college to university. So this is gonna be heavily UX focused, but at the same time, we're gonna tie it to learning experiences. So the first thing I wanted to bring up is by 2020, customer experience will overtake price and product as the key differentiator. And that's really just around the corner. I mean, that's less than two years away. So it's it's super important. And just to stress it again, if you're listening, I'm going to say it one more time. So by 2020, customer experience will overtake price and product as the key differentiator, which means people are going to be more concerned as they're becoming increasingly more concerned about the actual experience of interacting with something, more so than price. So why do we focus on experience? Well, the learner has changed. Our 
the the role has really changed from isolated to connected and from unaware to informed and from passive to active and our peers whether they're designers or non-designers or just people in the lnd space that are focused on providing a quality experience are recognizing the need to keep up with pace of society and maintain a competitive advantage everything these days is experience driven from driving a car eating dinner going to the grocery store and it's all about behavioral insights and one of those reasons is this access to information that our learners now have they've got access to unprecedented amounts of information which allows them to make more informed decisions as a result of this their bs radar is higher so it really is about providing value to them not just hoping that they'll they'll play around and, and be happy. Uh, they also have a global view, so they can access information from around the world and find out about differences, not only in feature or price, but just different styles or opportunities that are available for them to learn from. And it doesn't matter where they are. It, it can be location to location. Beyond that, there's a, a deeper level of social sharing. So users are learners are more open to share ideas without worrying about social or geographical barriers through social media. It's a lot easier to talk about a, a good or a bad experience and share that with colleagues, with people in your organization, with people outside of your organization, and people are definitely open to doing so. Beyond that, there's this experimentation culture too that's going on in learning. You know, learners can experiment and use these digital products before they decide to, to actually go full-fledged into the course. They can experiment and start to try things out to see if it's right for them. Now, sometimes within an organization, you really don't have a choice. You know, at Polaris, we have Polaris University and whether it's a good or bad experience, you know, everyone kind of has to go through it. But the feedback that we provide helps them make that a better experience over time. And because the learner has evolved, these are really exciting times, especially with the opportunity we have with a workforce that is overburdened with lengthy training. We want to really make sure that they're learning but staying productive also. So just to give a little quote and, and base it on online so uh, or web, 88% of online users are less likely to return after a bad experience. Beyond that, almost half of them express a less positive perception of the company overall after a single bad experience. And more than a third of those told others about their disappointing experience. We cannot afford to lose engagement today. The stakes are too high. We're under the radar more and more. So what we really need to do is, is to stop that spread. Bad news spreads fast. People are more likely to share having a bad experience than they are when they have a good experience. So we talk about experience and just going to like a UX version, user experience definitions of, of what makes experiences and then to tie them to kind of learning and L&D. Uh, when we talk about an experience, they connect customer needs to business outcomes and they have to be consistent so that they can help users feel comfortable and familiar with them. Same thing for learners. We want them to feel as comfortable in their experience as possible. The experience is not just how the product looks. It's more about satisfaction or delight learners have when interacting with it, when going through the coursework, when experimenting and trying and, and navigating their way through the experience. It's also not about, uh, you know, it, it is about outcomes, right? So it's, it's about allowing learners to achieve desired outcomes when they're performing their necessary tasks. Beyond that, it, it's not about a single task or touch point. The overall experience encompasses all aspects of the learner's interaction with the company and its products and services and the learning environment across the entire ecosystem of offerings. And Forrester tells us that the average adult in the United States uses more than four connected devices throughout the day. We have to think about that and understand how they use technology so that we can provide content to them in a way that matches the way they naturally consume it. Peter Mirholz, who was uh, is a designer that was behind a company called Adaptive Path, which was the first UX company to be purchased 
um, by a large organization. They were purchased by Capital One to really help the bank focus on customer experience. Um, he talks about the experience being the product and the only thing users care about. And that is true if you think about it. People are more likely to connect that product to the company and to learning to anything when you're interacting with something that really does take on the face of the company that you're interacting with. So as employees, for me, for example, when I'm in Polaris University, when I have a bad experience, that makes me feel not so great about Polaris. But if it's great, I get more motivated about my company and what they do. So it really is important to focus on the experience. So how do we craft experiences in the L&D space? Well, LX, which we'll use for, for learning experiences, you know, you could probably rattle off many types of learning experiences that, that didn't exist a decade ago. Things like blended learning, that, which is now a, a multi-layered solution that results from a holistic look at a performance problem. In addition to classroom and online learning, a few of the experiences that can now be part of the blend include augmented reality and virtual reality. It's now easier to take situations and leverage them in an online or even offline learning capability. Um, think about in, in healthcare. I've seen doctors or, or people that work in hospitals train in situations using augmented reality that make it seem so real that it's easier. It's, it's kind of this hands-on learning and I've heard really positive feedback about that. Beyond that, blogging. People are getting a lot of information from blogs. It makes sense for companies to have a blog, an education blog, ways to continue to learn that are not traditional. Also chats and forums. Online chats, moderated forums allow very conversational dialogue and discussion back and forth where people are basically learning from each other. Organizations that allow this type of learning or user-generated content are have a lot higher engagement rates. Speaking of that, we're talking about some collaborative learning. People, you know, you have to really think about people's learning styles and what that looks like. But ultimately, when you put people that are not necessarily working together all the time and let them tackle a problem together and have diverse perspectives, it really does help them learn and get them more engaged in learning while meeting other people and building relationships. That leads to social communities, places like Facebook, Twitter, social media, or, or just creating your own community within your learning environment. Allow your learners to interact and engage with each other in their own time and continue to have dialogue and have more emotional investment into the community. And then there's digital curation. So we are able to curate articles in content hubs or just different locations that we can organize these areas where people can go and get information easily. And it makes sense to match their mental model. And of course, mobile applications. As we see more and more traffic is leaning towards mobile. Uh, even at Polaris, you know, 65% of our traffic for our website is mobile. And people are used to, to interacting, learning on the go, and we have to make sure that when you're creating a learning experience that you're taking mobile into consideration. Podcasts are another great way that people learn, uh, if, especially if you have a commute. It's very easy to just throw, throw on a podcast, put on some headphones, get immersed in a world, and, and just continue to, to learn or think about things. And it, it's a really good way to reach out to your learners and, and stay top of mind and let them passively listen and still gain information. Also things like gamification help allow making learning fun. People tend to be naturally competitive. So if you really start to provide them a way with a leaderboard or, or a way to earn badges or credits, it seems to really promote engagement. And beyond that, any interactive media tends to have a better engagement rate, whether they be video or 
there's really a, a way to interact with people through text messaging. I don't know if you're familiar with the Quartz app. That allows you to get news in a way that you would send kind of like a text message. So you get like a blurb of news and from there you can respond a certain way and based upon how you respond, you can dive deeper into that news um, category or that, that news feed that you were just reading or you can skip it and it will present you with more. It really is a good way to provide content to people and make them feel like it's a, a natural engagement that they're used to, a natural behavior that they use. So this uh, UX process for, for learning experiences is a very typical design process. And uh, it starts with, you know, we understand a problem and, and we know that pain points come in all the time. And I would definitely say if, if you're a designer or you work with a designer, you tend to see that designers have a way of, of understanding a specific problem and the behavior around it. And from there, trying to identify unarticulated needs. A lot of times we hear a lot of our pain points, but the solution really shouldn't be let's just add a feature. It's more about how can we take a step back and improve this overall experience. So a, a typical design process starts with discover. It's understanding the learner, assessing their needs. From there, we start to define the problem. This can be through collaborative hypotheses exercises, things that we're going to really test. How do we gain insight and define a problem? Who are we gonna focus on? What is the specific learner? Do we have a persona for them? How are we going to uh, start to solve a problem that we have for them or a way that we can teach them something? And from there, we start to curate, right? So we have a selection of, uh, you know, are there relevant open educational resources if available. If not, if it's all proprietary, if it can't be shared, if it's gotta be hidden behind a, a wall or a firewall or within your internal system, you have that content that's available. From there, we start to build something, right? We develop and refine a solution. And this is typical in, in any design process. It's co-creation almost. We are sketching something, an idea, playing with something, building a prototype, putting it in front of learners to get insights. And that's where the learning for us happens. We are actually observing them take the course, see what problems they have, understand and take that feedback to iterate and make things better. And that's how we evolve. We're working on iteration and it really is the best way to uh, to move things forward and learn. And it's an in you know, a really important part of the development process. This is really important to, to do in a way that makes sense and continue to iterate because what we wanna do is make sure that we're getting feedback as we're trying to build this learning experience so that we're not launching a course or a, a learning experience or anything before it's fully tested. It's a lot easier and less expensive when you realize that it's maybe not the right course or it's not meeting your objectives and you could do that early and with a lot of customer feedback before spending the time to fully design and develop it and launch it and then have to scale it back after the fact. So the earlier you can find that something is wrong and figure out how to fix it and change and pivot, the easier it is and less expensive it is for your company. So for us, it really is about understanding learners, right? And, you know, as a as a L and D designer or a, just someone that's really focused on on outcomes and and the learning experience, the way we do it in UX is we start with contextual inquiry, right? So contextual inquiries are interviews and observations that take place in the user's natural environment. You basically ask users questions and then you observe them using the product and completing tests in that environment. This allows the results to be more accurate. They're more realistic. And an L&D contextual inquiry also allows us to observe the target audience, the learners, the specific segment of learners that we identified and let them navigate and interact with a prototype of any product or course while they're in their work environment, when they're in their office, wherever they take these courses. And then as you ask questions, it'll allow us to to understand it and gain insights into the usability and the effectiveness for learning that we're offering them. From there, it's really important to, to do journey mapping. And I'm sure a lot of you 
are familiar with journey maps and, and use journey maps. If you're not, journey maps capture key touch points and emotions as a user interacts with a product or service. For example, to map the experience of, of an employee signing up for benefits, the key touch points might be accessing the website, searching for a specific form, reading the instructions for that form, filling out that form, and then submitting it. Uh, it's important to understand the emotions, what part of that is enjoyable for them. You know, accessing the website, how easy is that? How easy is it to search for things? How intuitive are the instructions and completing the tasks? And an L&D journey maps can really help better understand the experience that our learners have when discovering or completing tasks within a course. Persona development is really important too. So personas refer to creating a profile of an ideal user of a product or service that represents their common traits or goals. This really helps designers focus on the human-centered aspect of design. Uh, you know, designers for learning experiences can use learner personas during the design and development phase. This really will help teams to build empathy for users and create solutions that are better aligned to those users' goals and characteristics. If you've seen personas before, they're basically, um, you know, we, we have them hanging up. I, I see one from out of the corner of my eye. It's a picture of somebody that is the definition of one of our writers at Polaris. It's some demographics about them, what they like aside from Polaris products, what their interests are, what their, their key demographic is, what their goals are, and really how we can help provide a better writing experience here for them. It would be the same for a learner and the learning experience. And, and when I was at 3M, as we were building out Healthcare Academy, we had to understand the difference. You know, a, a nurse comes in to use our software very differently than, um, you know, a CDI specialist or a medical coder. At the same time, you know, there might be pieces of the experience that overlap. So we have to be aware of the people that we're designing for. Uh, we also do card sorts. So I would say that card sorts are, are really helpful in, in gaining behavioral insights. They provide a look into how people organize information based on their mental models. This helps label content, navigation, and organize the structure of data. Members of our target audience, those personas are given the names or, or just users, learners that we're testing with. We give them names of topics and ask them to organize these topics into meaningful categories. For L&D, card sorting can help understand how learners relate to instructional content, which then provides insight for how to structure and organize these learning portals or e-learning courses and even mobile apps. And then of course there's A-B testing. A-B testing determines which of two or more designs is most effective for a particular audience. So you can split up into segments. Think of if you shop on Amazon, sometimes you go into Amazon and there may be something moved or the search is different or the content is different. It's because you might be getting served a test to see which performs better. Um, these designs might differ in copy, types of interaction, visual design, or even something on the user interface. In L&D, you can use A-B testing software for learning portals, mobile apps, or other online web resources. For example, you can provide learners with two different experiences and see if they understand the instructions, how they respond to the design, and see if they're able to work through an interaction while you're collecting data from their behavior and use and comparing the results of each version to see which one works better. So now we've talked about kind of this, this test, this experience, and if a lot of you are heavily involved in, in building these learning experiences, we've got this concept called MVP, Minimum Viable Product. And that really is like, let's put something small out, learn from it and improve. And MVP, you know, is it's a very common phrase in software development, a very common term. Uh, a lot of people are focusing on what's minimally viable. Uh, I would really like to change that. It, it's kind of like my quest. 
I would like MVP to go away, right? Now, maybe just getting rid of it is a little bit harsh, but we have to think, is MVP really working? Should we focus on minimum quality? I mean, let's look at this just a little bit differently. So I was at a conference, a design conference, uh, two years ago now in San Antonio, and I, Maria Guidis, who's the chief design officer at Autodesk, gave a really interesting take on MVP. And right now you're looking at a, a cake, right? This is a cake without icing. Now, if this was sitting in your office, uh, people would eat it, right? Obviously. I mean, I would eat it if I saw it on the counter. But the truth is, I don't know if I would buy a cake that looks like this. And, you know, it's it's just big, but it's not finished. And I kind of worry, like, if I take a product that's really not finished, how will that affect my learners or my users at the end of the day? Will that make them less likely to come back because we didn't fully think things through? So let's take a look at this. This is a cupcake. I mean, this is what I would like to call MLE, which stands for Minimum Lovable Experience. I mean, who doesn't love a cupcake? It may be a little bit smaller. It may be a micro interaction, but it's complete and thought through. I can use it from end to end and have a really quality experience. So maybe instead of building completely from A to Z, but only getting to like halfway through and the experience suffering because of it, Maybe we really should focus on a smaller chunk to build out. Maybe we go A through C and completely build it out so that it's successful and users can interact with it and learners can learn and, and then get excited about content and coming back and taking more courses. To me, we really should be focusing on what we can put out that really feels complete and is loved by our users. So what really makes something a minimum lovable experience versus a minimum viable experience? Well, you know, creating experiences people love requires a shift in traditional thinking. There must be an emotional connection established through building a solid relationship with our learners to understand their pain points and desired results. And again, that goes back to being both articulated and unarticulated. So as I mentioned earlier, you have to provide value to the learner, truly creating value. Does it solve an unmet or unarticulated need? Is it even worth doing? It also needs to be easy to use. Does it remove friction? Does it enhance a workflow or an outcome? Beyond that, it should be well-crafted. This is the difference between good and great products. Is this something the team is proud of? Is this something the organization is proud of? Does it have clean, beautiful code? Is the design delightful or magical? Does the learner go in and complete the tasks that they initially wanted to complete? Does it meet their needs? You know, you have to empower your, your team and your learners by shipping quality products, services, and experiences. Your learners will be happy, the team will be proud, and then your organization as a whole will be satisfied. So, if we think about that and think also about what makes a great learning experience, well, we're gonna go back to value, right? A great learning experience adds value to the learner. It helps them understand something that they couldn't before. The entire experience should feel purposeful and put the learner's needs first. A great learning experience also focuses on being effective. This is pretty straightforward. If it's not effective, then it really has failed at being a learning experience. But you have to realize 94% of first impressions are design related. And the functionality and ability to achieve their desired results are at the core of an effective experience. So being visually rich, interactive, and enjoyable are all important, but they should be used to enrich the learning, not to substitute for it. It also needs to be engaging, right? A great learning experience should be engaging. Learners should feel that the content is somewhat personalized to them. By focusing on different learning styles, you can make certain content feel personalized because learners are more likely to engage with content that matches their individual learning style. We can't customize everything based on specific learning styles, but if you offer multiple 
types of learning styles in your solution, you will engage people in different ways. And that's really important to make them feel like, wow, I really get this. This was a course that just fits me and, and it was easy for me to learn from. Beyond that, you know, a great learning experience promotes further learning. Learning just to pass a course, to, to get a certificate in something, compliance or, you know, I just completed a data security test. That's not just just passing that is not the outcome we're striving to achieve. Learning experiences should really inspire people to become lifelong learners and encourage them to pursue education beyond just the course that we're creating. I would like to get as inspired from the course as possible so that I could go out and do additional learning, whether that be, you know, my own personal research on the web or decide, hey, you know, this this security assessment, it was really an enjoyable course for me. I want to learn more about security. I want to be able to talk to other people about security. That's how we promote continuous learning. But we have to be careful when working with our teams. You know, understand that products are iterative and we have to put something out to test and learn from, but we really have to make sure that we're putting out something that's worthwhile. So how do we do this is really focus on these elements of value. And, and these are based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basically, human actions arise from an innate desire to fulfill needs that range from basic to complex. Value is definitely subjective, but focus on developing solutions that solve meaningful, often complex learning problems. So at the base of the, the pyramid is functional. This solves everyday problems for learners as they engage with the course. Beyond that, it's emotional. Can we create an experience that connects with them and promotes loyalty over time? Does it make them want to go back and check to see if they have courses or do they really just wait for that email that says, oh, you have to complete this course within 30 days? Can, can they become life-changing? Does it truly solve a need, whether inward or outward focused? And the pinnacle is really social impact. And that makes a difference that improves the greater good. Now you're probably thinking I'm crazy and a lot of these things don't actively apply to what you're doing. And, and I understand that that can be true. Not all of these elements within these, these pillars can be applied to learners and L&D, but I want you to be aware of them because you know, you're building a learning experience, but that's really just one part of the overall experience for learners, for employees, for your organization. So the examples that I give may not also directly reflect L&D, but they're meant to, to get inspired from other industries and just think about things a little bit differently. So when we truly talk about functional value, these are the basics. You know, are we offering an experience that saves time? Does it take less time completing tasks or transactions? You know, think about the retail industry. They have in-store pickup for online orders or next day delivery. These are things that are really helping them grow in their industry because they're helping their, their users save time. And we can definitely do this in L&D. We can help them save time that it takes to, to take a course and, and not just give them a skip button for certain content because then when they can't skip content, it's a very inconsistent experience. Um, can we simplify tasks? Can we reduce complexity? You know, again, you know, Amazon is a great example of this. They have that one-click feature that simplifies the order checkout process. You know, even the ability to sign in as a guest or, you know, in your environment in L&D, can, can it just save your login information so you don't have to log in every time you have to go to, to take a course? Uh, you know, making money, increasing revenue, that that is definitely functional value for the organization. Uh, can we reduce risk? Can we protect learners from losses? You know, one of the examples I'll give is Charles Schwab. They have this accountability guarantee, and it basically refunds fees if clients are not fully satisfied with their investment product. You know, if if you happen to be in L&D but, but working a little bit behind a paywall, you know, maybe you're working with a company like Skillshare that people have to pay to access content over time. You know, maybe if they're not satisfied with a course, there's the ability to refund them or, you know, give them access to a different course that, that may better suit their needs. Um, beyond that, 
you know, can we help them become more organized? And and the example that pops into my head right now is the container store. I, I just bought a bunch of those to uh, to store some shoes, right? It helps me organize my possessions at home. So I, I'm a big fan of theirs. A, a little bit more money than I thought plastic containers would cost, but at the end of the day, like it helps me see my shoes and, and organize them. And, and I really like that. And right now I'm getting the winter shoes put in the closet and pulling out some of the summer shoes. Uh, and then can we integrate different aspects of life? Think about Square. If you've never seen Square, it's a way to accept payments through credit card at retailers. And, you know, it offers invoice management, payroll, other service that integrate billing functions into a POS software. And they also offer hardware that has that software on there. So it's almost like a little cash register in an iPad. And, and that just really helps them integrate things. And then, you know, can we connect with other people or systems? Uh, I'll use Polaris as an example or, or even Red Bull, right? So anything that, that has extreme sports competitions, that connects these competitions to communities that connect enthusiasts around the world. Uh, here in Minnesota, we actually have Red Bull crashed ice where in front of the St. Paul Cathedral, they set up a course and it's almost like roller derby on ice skates. It's it's pretty impressive. Um, so can we also help learners or, or users reduce effort? Can they get things done more easily? Uh, Facebook added the ability to send money directly to friends through the Messenger app. Uh, can we help avoid hassles? So, you know, Reducing hassles, avoiding hassles, those are going to pay off in, in building a relationship with your learner, your customer over time. Again, giving you an outside perspective, Zappos, that free shipping and generous return policy they offer really does make things easier and avoid those hassles. Um, are we reducing costs? Can we save money in purchases, fees, or subscriptions? You know, a lot of retailers introduce budget brands to do this, which is uh, something that you're seeing more and more happen. Uh, it's all about quality, right? Quality is just a, a, a lower tier level of functional value, providing high quality or goods or services. So USAA uh, is an insurance company for people that were in the military and their families, and they deliver high quality insurance, banking, and investment products and services that are tailored to their members. The thing with quality though, you know, I'm sure you can all agree, Providing a quality experience is really table stakes for us. That's what the organization expects us to provide. So we want to make sure that we're doing that in multiple ways. Um, and then do we offer variety? Are there multiple options or scenarios to choose from? And this is directly something that L&D can impact. Can we offer courses in different ways? Can we offer them on different devices. Let's, let's talk about Fitbit for an example. You know, they started just being a simple step counter and now they have different products, watches for everyday users and high performance athletes too. And then can we appeal to their senses? You know, do we offer audio content? or different visuals that really inspire people. Think about Starbucks or, or, yeah, Starbucks is a good example of improving their non-coffee products because they purchased Tivana and a bakery and that really offers more than just coffee. And then finally, we talk about can we inform people? And, and in L&D, of course, that's what we're doing. We're, we're informing people. We're helping them learn. Uh, re, we're providing reliable and trusted information about a topic you know, Vanguard is a is a non L and D example. They added a low fee advice service to their core investment services, which is really well. And if we really had to take a deep dive on one, just one that provides access to information, I'm going to go with the Weather Channel. You know, with everything that happened this past year, uh, the Weather Channel provides access to information about weather across multiple touch points and devices in multiple formats. People affect. by Hurricanes Harvey and Irma were able to use their application to find out information. The same thing can be applied in L&D, like reducing time and cost by providing optimized learning opportunities at times while within the work environment to avoid bringing in costly trainers or relying on a classroom setting and teacher to be present at specific times. These are ways that we can provide functional value. But we have to provide more than just functional value. The next step is emotional value. And really a lot of these can be tied to L&D. And I feel that 
you know, it's really important that we are providing emotional value to, to our learners. So, you know, when we talk about anxiety, can we help them worry less, feel more secure? Think about Discover, allowing cardholders to instantly freeze and unfreeze their accounts without canceling their card. Um, can we provide benefits for being a loyal customer or learner? Something like Hilton's Hilton Honor Points that, uh, you know, I travel, I stay at a lot of Hilton hotels because I really like this reward program. Can we provide a sense of nostalgia to them? You know, reminding people of something positive from their past. And another example is like retro video games. People really get excited about retro video games. And if we can offer some sort of gamified content that feels retro to them, I think it's really going to provide a, a, a good emotional connection. Aesthetics, like I said, 94% of first impressions are design related. So, you know, can we provide an appealing, appealing form of design? And, and an example would be Apple, right? Their attention to design has really helped differentiate its products from the competitors. Uh, can we represent achieved status or aspirations? And, and again, you know, this doesn't have to be gamification. Something like Prada or a leaderboard. I, I, I jumped to Prada because I, I just watched The Devil Wears Prada over the weekend. But, you know, Prada's understated luxury clothing and accessories are designed to be recognized by people, but not just every single person, more like fashionistas, more people that are that are looking for that. So can we really like provide value? Do we get people excited maybe through like a leaderboard? Um, beyond that, can we promote wellness in our courses? Can we really improve people's physical or mental state? Um, Weston did this a while ago by adding fitness equipment and clothing rentals to reposition the bar their brand for being more focused on wellness. Um, can we provide some sort of therapeutic value or well-being also? So Dr. Scholes, right, in case you have a, a foot condition. Can we entertain them, right? We really need to get them excited about learning. It's not – nobody wakes up and says, you know what, today I just want to take this course for my organization. It's more like it's the day before this is due and I have to just jump in and do it and I'll walk away and hit play and come back. And, you know, if we offered fun or entertainment that – would help them engage and, and break it into smaller pieces. Think about cruise lines, right? They offer like around the clock entertainment. I'm not saying to, to throw parties and rock climbing and involve all sorts of gamification, but can I go in and watch a video and continue that video later? And where can I pick it up? And what does that look like? Um, also, can it be making people feel more attractive or better about themselves? Uh, think about Nike's campaigns, their positive, inclusive messaging that inspires people to be their personal best. Can we really focus on motivating people throughout the course and inspiring them to continue and go further? And then can we provide access to information? Um, you know, CVS Health is a great example. They added in pharmacy clinics that provide basic medical services and wellness services. Now, that's not exactly an L&D example, but in L&D, providing access to information is what we do, and we should be able to do that well. Uh, you know, just to give an example of, of who provides emotional value, I'm going to go with Starbucks, right? I am not I, – I go to Starbucks every day. Uh, I really like their app. I like that they offer loyal customers who sign up for their rewards program with perks and conveniences. I just, you know, I order my my $3 Trenta iced coffee with non-fat milk and no sweetener every morning. And I can't wait till I get enough points to get a free drink. And then I go and, like everyone else, I order the, the five-pump caramel macchiato with uh, three extra shots. And I don't pay anything for it, which is really amazing. And it really makes me want to go back every day. And I be, I've become a loyal customer because of that. Um, you know, beyond that, as we start to really move up the experience uh, pyramid, the the thing that we want to provide is life-changing value, right? Do we want to give our learners hope, something to be optimistic about? This is really important because, you know, a lot of the courses that they take are, are mandatory, and we want them to really feel like they're learning and developing and getting better because of it. Can we give them a sense of personal accomplishment or improvement? You know, think about Leica cameras. People buy those in part from the pride of owning a camera used by famous photographers. 
you know, maybe if your CEO has completed these courses or your director has completed these courses, that may make your employees want to complete these courses as well to, to at least have those same certifications. Again, can we motivate them? Can we help them achieve their goals? Uh, you know, Spotify did a great job of this in real life by adding a music streaming feature for runners. It detects their tempo and finds music that matches it. Can we understand their behaviors while they're going through a course and, and maybe provide some sort of background music track that kind of changes its tempo based on if we feel like they're slowing down their pace or, you know, maybe it does get slower if there's a lot of reading that we want our, our users to do or our learners to do. Um, can it feel like an heirloom? Is it a good investment for future generations? Again, this doesn't apply to L&D. I think more of a company like Rolex where it positions its watches as cherished possessions designed to last and accompany success of generations. But you know, in the L&D space, can we provide people with a sense of belonging? Can we help them become part of a group, identify with others they admire? You know, at Polaris, when we talk about Polaris University or even our customer bases, our employees, we want them to have this feeling about our brand the way sports teams have about, or the way sports fans have about those teams. That, that fanatical fan base is really what makes people feel like they're part of something. Think of a company like Apple, right? You know, Steve Jobs would go out and speak to their employees and they would all be riled up and super proud to be Apple employees. We need to provide that type of experience to our learners. You know, one company that, that does a really good job of helping users improve themselves through uh, life-changing skills of meditation and mindfulness is Headspace. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I would suggest definitely checking them out. Uh, finally, the pinnacle, you know, how do we provide this value through social impact and self-transcendence, which is helping others or society more broadly than, than self-interest? Now, you might be thinking that's a little bit difficult to do in the L&D space. You know, think of a company like Tom's. When Tom sells a pair of shoes or eyewear, a new pair of shoes goes to an impoverished child. And part of that profit may go to save the eyesight of people in developing com countries. Well, in education, there's something called the University of People. And if you're not familiar with them, they provide tuition-free higher education through an online campus. Since launching, they've accepted about 700 students from 100 different companies to their three and four year programs for business and computer science. Recently, they opened up computer centers in Haiti so that students with limited internet access could enroll in their courses. That is a great way to give back. It's, it's really about making people feel good. So, you know, just to give you some tips as you're designing these learning experiences or trying to provide these valuable experiences for your learners, you know, things to consider are to design for multiple devices. Learners are switching from device to device and your course needs to adapt with them. Leverage responsive design templates when possible. Allow your learners to start watching your class on their office computer and maybe finish it on their phone or tablet on the way home, picking up where they left off, truly making a consistent experience that is seamless. You know, it's also important to understand their reading patterns. You know, the Nielsen Norman group revealed that people prefer to read, especially web content in an F, F shape, basically two stripes across and one stripe down. This tells us that people rarely read all of the text on a page thoroughly and that they concentrate more on the top of the page. So be concise, keep important information at the top, start subheadings and paragraphs and bullet points with information carrying words. Uh, and you know, don't just subject your learners to, to a ton of information. Information overload is, is a real thing. There's nothing worse than a course page packed with tiny, dense text with a menu that directs you to a million different resources and no clear direction. You have to then choose what you really need on each page. Avoid using multiple fonts, colors, different sizes. Keep images consistent in size and shape. All of this will reduce the cognitive load and help the learner complete the course more easily. Uh, and then don't assume that they know exactly what to do when they start a course. Make it clear to your learners what to read and watch first and where to go once they've completed each lesson. Make sure they're super quick and easy for them to find the topic or lesson that they want or need to complete. Provide clear titles, tabs, and categories in language that they understand. 
improve navigation by adding chapters and bookmarks to car courses so that if they get distracted and stop halfway through, it can pick up right where it left off. These will increase engagement and give the learner an element of control, turning them into an active rather than a passive learner, which improves learning and retention. So Josh Burson, who's a famous learning commentator, says that the learning curve is the earning curve. And, and I kind of love that, and that's true. So company leaders are increasingly focused on organizational design as a top priority. As the workplace adapts to a new, more collaborative and networked structure, it must also adapt to a new type of employee who seeks new ways to continuously join, learn, contribute, and grow at work. And as L&D takes a more empathetic, human-centered, and experienced-focused approach to learning, L&D teams need to align solutions to specific business needs. It's not just how the work is done or how performance objectives are met, but how things can be made to work better across the entire business. Empathetic, holistic learning experiences should consider and leverage the best of learning theory and science, people dynamics, and technology to deliver maximum return. Don't focus on the technology first. The technology is the enabler. Focus on the content and the experience. So this means thinking about how do we track learners' growth, proficiency building in meaningful ways? Where do the non-cognitive and social and emotional elements get accounted for? Do we know how learners are doing relative to learning goals? Is assessment used to move learning forward? These are key things to think about. You know, at the end of the day, the business is gonna look for us to have provided value to their employees or, or through the courses that we provide. So we've gotta figure out how to measure them. And outcomes that are clearly easy to measure are black and white. So when thinking about ways to best measure and evaluate performance in the workplace, we use data analytics. There is a new interest in revealing valuable data about activities that can be tracked and the best approaches for changing behavior, preventable errors, and much, much more. You know, it's also important to focus on productivity from the time to complete a task or course to reducing the steps in a workflow to complete a task or just reducing the amount of errors users have or learners have throughout a course. And then also, can we save money by, are there training costs associated with the product? Not the training that they're taking in their class, but do they have to learn how to use the LMS or the system? You know, if you make that easier to use, it will require less training. How about support? Can you automate it? What about development costs? You think about a, you know, software like Excel. I would say that 5% of the features are used 95% of the time. Let's eliminate the unnecessary or marginal features. Find the five or 25% of features or whatever percent that learners are using and focus on that. This allows you to free up time, money, and resources for designers, for developers, for course creators, for content strategists to work on improving core features and find new ways that add value to the learner. Then we've got some gray areas, right? What about things that aren't so black and white? Some outcomes fall into gray areas, which aren't really easy to measure. And since you know our organization understands how to translate this to dollars, we may have to do a little math to figure out financial impact of some of these measurements. So user feedback, things like surveys, SUS scores, net promoter scores, loyalty and customer satisfaction are all extremely difficult to measure, but not impossible. If people love your product, they're likely to recommend it to colleagues. This can lead to, to new learners, which can be tracked and tied to, to specific dollar amounts. You know, if, if your product is something that you monetize, you know, it's a lot cheaper and easier to get uh, new customers than retain existing ones. So you have to figure out your retention rates and compare that with your cost per acquisition. There's a lot of math you can do. Um, let's really focus on student engagement, right? You know, this is a way to rank how learners feel they're engaged with their course materials, instructors, and communities in categories that you can benchmark. You know, and chances are, if you're involving your learners to validate your solutions, like we talked about earlier before you launch them, you've gotten used to modifying them. The earlier you make these changes, like I mentioned before, the less expensive they are. Changing wireframes is less complex than changing designs, which is less complex than changing code, which is still considerably less expensive than changing something once it's in production and then scrambling to fix it after. 
And then we need to focus on specific learning outcomes and a system of assessment to measure the outcome. And those can vary from industry to industry. So I'm going to wrap up with a few little stats that, that are interesting that you can take back to the office with you today. Um, you know, UX defined and validated requirements resulted in a 50% decrease in wasted development hours. That really just means it's important to, to define and validate the material, the content for the course before you go ahead and build it and then realize that it didn't work. Uh, also, you know, testing with users, learners, that results in a 90% reduction in support costs. It helps you realize where things are going wrong or what learners aren't understanding and allows you to fix them before you launch them so that they're not calling into support because they can't figure out something or they're having a technology problem. So finally, how do you know that, that you're, you're succeeding, that you're doing this right? Uh, some companies have refined their products to deliver more value elements, while others have really just used the elements to identify their perceived strengths and weaknesses. If all you want to do is provide functional value, that's great, do that. Um, but really, you know, how you know you're succeeding is there's growth, right? Leadership recognizes L&D as one of the strongest drivers of employee engagement and workplace culture. You're attracting talent. In order to attract new talent, organizations must expand their total value proposition to employees. To stay competitive, companies are offering employee avenues for training, development, and coaching. And that's really why we're all here today. We have that opportunity from our organization and retention. The top organizations realize that the key to retaining top employees is understanding how to provide growth opportunities by delivering learning tools these employees will need to stay current. So, I mean, I'd really like us to, to just kind of commit to each other right now that we're gonna focus on shipping quality and creating valuable learning experiences because at the end of the day, the experience that we provide for our learners are a reflection directly upon us and our organization. And we really wanna make sure that we're providing value to them. So with that said, I thank you for spending your, your hour with me today. I think we have time for maybe one question if someone has submitted a question. Uh, also, there's a lot of references that I'll share through this document so that you can go and, and read a lot more on some of the things that I talked about and dive a little bit deeper. I think you'll really enjoy them. All right, Andy, thank you. Yeah, we have time for about one question. I did have a few come through asking if this was recorded. This webinar is re is being recorded and will be sent out uh, here within about 48 hours. You'll have an email from HCM Events. So we're gonna take uh, the first, we're gonna take our one question here and this one's gonna come from Terry. Uh, Terry's question is, how do you measure how effective and engaging the learning is? And I know you talked a little bit about this earlier, but. Sure, so to, to really measure the effectiveness and, and the engagement, I would look at understanding the, the task flow. So there, there's going to be a flow that you've created of basically where someone starts and stops certain tasks. So I would measure the completion rate of those tasks. And it could be, you know, you don't wanna go like start to finish from a course, maybe it's a, a micro session within a course you can see if they're completing it and then give them a survey and ask them, you know, how was their experience? Try to understand how much time it took them and, and try to get a benchmark of how much time it takes to complete certain tasks. If you really focus task by task and separate them to, to build an overall course, as you find things that work and don't work, you can swap them out for different types of learners and still provide this end-to-end -end solution. So really just ask for feedback. The best way to ask somebody how they feel about something is to just ask them. Uh, it's really important to, to provide, you know, maybe incentivize them for, for providing that information. But it is coming down to a mix of qualitative and quantitative feedback. All right, Andy. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I also want to thank everybody in the audience for your participation. Um, if you enjoyed the web webinar, please take the time to 
fill out our post-event survey, which is going to appear right as this webinar ends. Your feedback is obviously very important to us here, and it really does help us improve our events moving forward. So again, I want to thank you, Andy, for taking the time to be here. I want to thank everybody in the audience. And I also want to thank the sponsors of today's Spotlight webinar at Cornerstone On Demand. So thanks again to everybody on the line. We'll see you all back here for our next Chief Learning Officer Magazine webinar that will take place actually that is tomorrow, May 17th. And that is titled Becoming a Partner to the Business, How Beachbody Built the Business Case for Learning Initiatives. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.